is an industrial namespace. Like you, I hear Walker, I hear you talking all the time about IIoT, Industry 4.0, MQTT. What and you you talk about the unified namespace? Can you show me what that looks like? Yeah, that was that came across as very contrived. <laughs> hey, intentionally, yeah. <laughs> but you know, the answer is yes. Um, so for you guys who are watching, I was just standing back here going, "Oh man, I don't want to shoot another video. My brain hurts." So like, and Zach is like, like, "He's like, video. we need to shoot another video." So he hits the camera and comes back here and asks this question. So um, I, what I was going to do is shoot a video on like showing you an example unified namespace. So for this will, um, you know, how we construct the unified namespace. So what I'm going to show you is an actual namespace that we've constructed for a project that we, uh, it's kind of been an ongoing thing for um, a little over a year. So it's, this is a big enterprise namespace. Mm -hmm. So what software is the namespace constructed in? So it is, um, the namespace is being managed in Ignition. Um, but this facility has Factory Studio, Ignition, SQL Server. We're going to add uh, Automation Intellect at this facility. Awesome. Um, so uh, looks like we're probably going to put Hybite in there, which we'll talk about in another another video. But this is kind of like our demo demo facility. But although they're an actual manufacturer, so this is um, our our unified namespace. So we have the the enterprise core namespace. Okay, and uh, we have the Dallas facility. Okay, and underneath that Dallas facility, we have um, we have the area. So in this case, we're gonna I might as well just use the real names. So this is uh, press. We also have uh, lamination, and we have uh, slitting. There's there's other, but we're gonna I'm gonna focus on the press side. So. We have the enterprise, we have Dallas, we have the press area, and then we have the presses. So in this case, we'll just do... This would be like a line? Press 1. Yep, this is, a, this is a line. So inside of press 1, we have the edge namespace. We have the uh, dashboard namespace. We have the OEE namespace. We call it line, but I'm going to call it OEE here, actually. Let me call it line. Sorry. That's why you're up here, Zach. Good job. We have the line namespace, and we have the MQTT namespace. All right. So the edge namespace is all of the OPC data. So in this plant, we have Kepware operating out, um, and Kepware is pulling every one of the machines. There's 16, yeah. 16 machines. So this is all the OPC data. It's all the stuff that's coming inbound from the edge. So we yeah. do all the process control and everything from there. Now, I like what I was kind of overseeing one of your earlier meetings. I like what you've done with the dashboard namespace because uh, in one of your dashboards, you have like queries, and maybe you're doing some post-processing of that data using Python and then displaying that on a dashboard. And what you've done is you've published that information back into the namespace so another software could consume that and they don't need to run those same algorithms. Yeah, so, so say I'm going to build a dashboard inside of Ignition. You right? use data set tags. Right, I'm going to build a dashboard inside of Ignition. And that dashboard is going to be for this line. So it's going to show things like, you know, um, it's going to show speed. And they'll have a trend there. It's going to show um, production. Right, how many linear feed is run through it? It's going to show downtime, uh, downtime events, and it's going to show a uh, trend, mm -hmm. maybe a line speed trend. The way most people in Ign most developers in Ignition, and we see this all the time, the w the way most people would build this is they would pull the data, they would pull the raw data from the namespace, right. they would process uh, all of it here. They would do run, maybe run queries on the root Pivot container, or or maybe create some containers. They may do some parsing, but they would run all of that on this window, mm -hmm. okay, to get the data to look the context that they want to create that visualization. Well, we don't do that, okay. The way that we do it is we create a dashboard namespace, and we do all of our processing here, okay. So right. we, we we may when we originally build the window. 
we may do everything just real quick, write the scripts and everything on the I window. Know. But then you would copy like the query and put it onto it. And then we put it inside this dashboard. So in inside the dashboard is all of these um, components, the speed component, the production component, the downtime component, the trend component. We generate all that contextual data and leave it in the namespace mm. so that some other consumer of data can connect to Ignition. I, we publish all this over MQTT. Mm. So they could go to the broker and get to the dashboard namespace, which contains all this information, right. and they could build their own dashboard. And guess what? Well, I got to... Oh. The data would be exactly the same. Okay. So whether the dashboard is living in Ignition. You just answered my yeah. question. I was going to play devil's advocate and say, but Walker, let's say, you know, Ignition, Factory Studio, it could do everything. If that's the only ever screen that that's ever going to exist on, then why not just do it there? Then why is it people use Power BI and Tableau? And why, even when you have exceptional solutions in your, in your, in your facility, stop assuming that we, we say this all the time. Don't make assumptions about how the, the way the data will be consumed. Right. So, so if you do that work here, now anyone can access it here rather than having that information be encoded on that screen. Correct. But here, let me, let's take it one step further. Because it lives here, it's also historized. It goes into the historian. Okay. So what was actually on the dashboard is historized. Right. And let's say that for some other reason, someone else pulls data from the edge and they do post-processing for their own visualization. And they come back in some production meeting and they go, well, I got x for my linear uh, or for my effective fee per minute uh, or i got y for my total production why is the dashboard saying x y or z we can now compare to that the actual historical value what we're able to do is historize what people actually saw right not just what was uh, just the raw transition so what's important is is that we create a namespace even for what we're visualizing right so the line contains the line contains all of the oee data Okay, so this is right. everything, work order context, the whole deal. So that'd be like if I'm automation intellect and I plug my uh, OE engine into the namespace, I can They draw it from the edge, yep. I consume the edge data, the events, the states, yep. publish back the OE calculations. And then they, they drop it back into our line screen, and so, or our line uh, UDT. And so when I have a visualization over here, mm -hmm. I, do have a, I do have a visualization over here that's got work order information, it's got OEE, it's got downtime and Paredos, and it's also got custom stuff, custom stuff. We pull it, we pull this OEE value from inside that part of the namespace. It doesn't matter that Automation Intellect or some other OEE calculator published it into the namespace. We visualize it from the same place in the namespace every time. Right. And the reason why is, again, an external consumer mm -hmm can retrieve that OE calculation without having to run the engine itself. It, what you'll see, and everybody will notice it, they'll, they'll say, hey, listen, you know, every piece of software I purchase has overlapping capabilities. Like, right. I've, you know, product A, product B, product C, they all have their own value in the market, but they all they have a lot of overlapping capabilities. And they'll say, how do I decide which one to mm -hmm. use? Like, if both will do that's dashboarding. That's why you need the namespace. That's why you need the namespace, so then you don't have to choose which one to use. Right. And, and we, we taught, met with a, a great company that's today. That's why you need to go open, because no manufacturer exactly. can, can solve every problem that a... That's exactly it, right? right? And then I want to go over the MQTT piece. Yeah, so, what's in there? So underside the MQTT namespace, which is obviously all poetry MQTT, this is generally a lot of abstracted data. So we may, in this MQTT UDT, we will pull events and transitions from the edge. We'll pull them into the MQTT UDT, and we may we can create things like lifetime counters. Oh. Uh, we can create status registers if one didn't exist, all that kind of stuff. But here's the other thing that we have. Um, this is where the the location of some additional contextual data. So in this in the case of this customer that we're talking about, we get we pull data in from their shop floor system. Okay, and we also pull data in from their specifications. Mm. So inside of shop floor, I have I have informations about the work order, uh, stand, um, standard downtime, etc. That information is pulled into the into the namespace and stored here for historization. It's also used. It's consumed by the OEE engine. Okay, same thing here. In this case, we are both of these are being pulled from databases. So we pull all that information contextually into the namespace so that it all lives in one place. Right. Now let's say for the sake of argument, somebody wakes up one morning and they say, you know what, I'm really, really sick of looking at my vision windows inside of Ignition. Okay? 
if and and so what I want to do is I want to build my own JavaScript application. JavaScript, or I want to use Perspective. Oh. Okay. Uh, all that work wasn't. Is the reason we kick everybody's ass when we quote against somebody who's doing a perspective project is because all the stuff that we visualize lives here in a unified namespace. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go through. I mean, when you originally go to perspective and you want to do all this event handling and you want to do all the post processing of data on the window, yeah. go ahead and try to convert a vision window and rebuild it in perspective inside of Ignition yeah. and try to do the same things that you do on a vision window. You can't. Right. It, you're, you're pulling your hair out. And it's the reason a lot of people are struggling. Okay. So this so, becomes the single source of truth. This is where all the information lives right. is you, in the namespace. If you do post processing anywhere, so if you do post processing of data anywhere, that like is an if Excel I, spreadsheet. If, if that that the result of that post processing needs to end up back into the unified yeah. namespace. Every layer of the stack is a, both a consumer and a producer of information. And here's why: because all we do, all we do is continue to add to the namespace, and we build on top of that initial framework. As we never grows. we never rebuild anything, mm. right? So if I want it, right, if I do it this way. If I build it this way, I just consume, right. and I don't do anything with what I've produced other than visualize. You're you're deprecated the moment you hit publish. That's right. You've 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 all the work that you put into doing post processing, the visualization that you built is the only one that benefits right. from it. It's archaic. Right? No yeah. reports can benefit from it. I mean, why not build a report? Why not build a report that is what was visualized on the dashboard over time? Wow. Why not do that? Or you could do what uh, was it the operator was looking at when the operator made the decision? Or, yeah, why is it you're not instead of what we do historize is this stuff from the edge because we're just used to it because yeah. we did it in Skater right? Yeah, we wanted yeah, to trend. Yeah. We d we always historize this, but why is it that that it's such a huge leap for people to go back and say, wait a minute, we should historize the abstracted data. Historize we should the historize the, the contextualized data. Let's historize what it is people were actually looking at. Yeah, because that is an important key. That's an important piece of information in order for you to do continuous improvement yeah, and, machine learning and, and, and professional growth. That's exactly it. So anyway, that is an example of so some people, that unified namespace. Some people refer to this as the digital twin. Why, why don't you like that? Uh, I, I don't like it either, but why don't you like? All right, so the, the, here's why. The, the, the issue I have with the concept people of People are going to be in the comments, oh, you only like unified namespace because you've coined the term and made it popular. Why do you? Well, why do I like the term unified namespace? It's because the digital twin didn't work. <laughs> okay, so I, I mean, I've been doing digital twins. I mean, again, there was a guy, I can't. Aviva likes the digital twin a lot. So. Yeah, and it, it's not that the concept of the digital twin is a bad concept, it's that it doesn't scale. That you don't build, when you create a digital twin, it, is, uh -huh. it was never built to be built upon. Right. It's static in time. It's, your digital twin is a snapshot right. of your business. This is a living. This is a real-time um, representation right. of your business, not just the structure, but the data that lives inside of it. Who manages the model? The modeling of these assets. Um, the that's a good question. So, like, is this a UDT? Is this a UDT? Um, yeah. So th this is not. These are gen so your UDTs are uh, here, here, user defined data types here. Okay. Um, the edge is generally not. It's generally a folder. This that, be a folder. Um, this is going to be a folder, folder, you may, folder. You may yep. have UDTs inside your edge. You may have UDTs inside. If you're going to do self-aware SCADA, you will. Right. Like so motor, if I, motor one, motor two. That's right. Because you would ha you, the motors would then be instances of a motor object that would map to a motor object on right. the screen. The reason this is important, the reason this is important, is because at the end of the day, all of this data is normalized, and there's not a lot of people who are going to understand what I'm saying there, but when it comes to machine learning, and I, I'm going to mm -hmm. a little sidetrack here. Right. Let's say I want to write I, I want to write a machine learning algorithm that is tracking two data points. Okay, and data point one is machine state. Actually, yeah. So data point one is machine state, right. and data point two is um, line speed. So. Uh, Okay, so data point two is line speed. When we look, when a machine learning algorithm, I mean, you would never write a machine learning algorithm to turn the relationship to do to do uh, linear regression between 
that, that shows the relationship between having the machine on and how fast it's going. But this is a simple, this is a simple example, okay? Right. So you'll notice that at one point our line speed and our, and our on register are 50-50, like and at the, another point it's a lagging indicator. So the, the line speed was up and then we saw the, or the, the line was running and then we saw the line speed go up. Right. Why is that? Why, would it, why is that something I could see inside of my data lake? Here's the answer. Yeah. The answer is, is that these transitions aren't real. Oh, it's this, polling. That's right, it's poll response. It's, there's lag in getting the transition from the edge all the way up into the data lake. Mm. So part of the reason we started building unified namespaces is that everything that lives in the name of space is already normalized. In real time. By virtue of being put into a single location. We can then create the timestamps for all of the transitions are lined up because of scan classes built in the namespace. Yeah. So again, you know, when one of the challenges that we have when I do these videos is, you know, I'm a world-class engineer and our right. team are world-class engineers. And, and so when we talk to one another, we talk very, and on a very, very high, we get really deep into the weeds. Yeah. When we shoot the videos, we, our goal is, is to speak to everyone. It's not to just speak to all the smart engineers who watch our content, but it's also to speak to executives to understand the right. structure, the, the, the CTOs to understand the, the overall value between the industry 3.0. People 3 that are in marketing. That's right, people in marketing. We're, try, we're trying to speak to everyone. Right. And one of the biggest challenges that we face is how do we turn a complex concept like this into one that's easy to digest yeah. when people can understand one that would give people the ability to understand that you can't just take a bunch of data throw it into a data lake and then write a machine learning algorithm that spits out a 100 percent certain assertion of uh, uh, that right. predicts that predicts some future event mm -hmm. and the reason why is is that the the rising and falling edges of these events that get once when they get stored in the data lake it isn't real that's not the real rising and falling edge. The real rising and falling edge happened out on the edge. And the only way to get that true event is to, be, is to have some edge device out there that's running at, that's pulling every one microsecond right. and is able to pick up the actual, you know, use the best sensors in the world that can pick up that right. super, super fast when transition. When it publishes the MQTT payload, it has the, the date, the timestamp along with the value that changed. Correct, exactly. Or any other values that changed and, all get sent in one payload. And, but you, but the, but the, but the value, the value has a timestamp associated with it. Right. So when if I package them as a JSON, I'll have this value change at this timestamp, oh. this value change at this timestamp, so this value. Even if it was a one second uh, payload, you're sending MQTT messages every one second. One might have changed at 250 milliseconds. One would have changed at 500. And we know what those values are. That's amazing. That's right. Um, sorry if we lost you guys there. Thank you guys for sticking to this end of this video. I have one last question. Sure. Just kind of playing devil as advocate on this namespace here. Let's yep. just say, hey Walker, you know, I, you know, I know my plant is in Dallas, but I'm never going to have more than one plant. Why do I need enterprise, you know, air, plant area? You know, why don't I just have my presses in a, you know, in a folder? Okay, so because. I, I, I'm I'm not I'm not a standardization Nazi, <laughs> but but I am a stand. So I, you would say go ahead do that, Zach. Right. I I would say well if you don't care about you're only ever going to have one plant go right ahead. But then don't plan to sell your plant to someone who may have a plant. Because uh, then, that, right? Exactly. Okay. So it don't it, you, you may you may have no plans. But ISA the ISA ninety five standard tells us how we should organize this data. It looks really pretty too. Yeah, it does look gorgeous. Alright, guys. Yeah. Like. Oh, nice. Subscribe. Sub. <laughs> I better spell this right. Yeah. Like, subscribe, share. There you go. Zach is a, he is a like, subscribe, share Nazi, though. I'll tell you that. Um, anyway, thanks for watching, guys. <laughs> See you later. Peace. Peace out, word. All right. It's a good video. Oh, shit. The camera stopped.